Like it or not, or believe it or not, Israel is the most important country in the world, not Texas. I probably should duck when I say that. Hi, behind. Israel is the most valuable real estate on the planet. In fact, God himself says of Israel in the book of Ezekiel that it is the best and most beautiful of all lands. Israel is, God, is ground zero for God's dealings with the world. There are Jews, and then there's everyone else. <laughs> there's Israel, and then there's every other nation. Salvation is from the Jews, and salvation is to be to the Jews first. Paul says in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Our Bible is thoroughly Jewish. It was written almost exclusively by Jewish men. Jesus the Christ was an ethnic Jew. He was and is the son of Abraham, son of David, and of the tribe of Judah. He was and is and will be the king of the Jews and Israel's Messiah, Savior. America is exceptional, but it's not Israel exceptional. <laughs> we're not the new Israel, we're not the new promised land, and we're not the new chosen people. For a glimpse of this, turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 11. Romans 11, and we'll look at a few verses here to get us started this morning. In verse 1, Paul says... I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. God has not rejected the Jewish people, has he? May it never be, Paul says. Now look at this next line. This is very interesting because it's present tense for the Apostle Paul, the Christian. He says, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Then look down at verse 25 of Romans 11. Paul goes on and he says, For I do not want you, brethren, and he's writing to the Roman church made up of Jews and Gentiles, uh, Christians, of course. And he says, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, so that there will not be an arrogance in you or a pride in you that is unfitting and inappropriate. There is a mystery. What is the mystery, Paul? Verse 25, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And that's the era we live in right now. We live in the era of the partial hardening. There are Jews who are saved from time to time, but the great majority of them are not. The great majority have a veil lying over their eyes and their hearts have been hardened. And so we're in this season of a partial hardening of Israel, ethnic Israel. And this season will last, verse 25 says, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. What does that mean? That means until the last elect Gentile is saved. This era will last. There is a fullness of the Gentiles that must come into the church, must come into Christ, and until that happens, this partial hardening will continue. And then once the last elect Gentile joins the church, that moment, I suppose, before the rapture, right? At that moment, God will then begin to orchestrate a series of events that will lead to verse 26. What will happen next in the big scheme of things is all Israel will be saved. Ethnic Jewish people at the return of Christ at the second coming will be rescued, will be saved, will be delivered from both God's wrath and man's hatred. And he quotes the Old Testament just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, that's heavenly Zion, and he will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they, Jewish people, are enemies for your sake, but from the standpoint of God's choice or election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Verse 29, for the gifts and calling and the calling of God are irrevocable are irrevocable. 
And so that just kind of sets the table for us this morning as we return to Matthew 13 and the parables of Jesus to his own people, the Jewish people. It's in Matthew 13 that we're learning about this mystery that Paul referred to there in Romans 11. This mystery of the kingdom of heaven, this mystery that these parables, there were seven of them in Matthew 13, reveal about this coming kingdom. God has not changed his mind about the nation of Israel and about the Jewish people, but the messianic kingdom has been postponed. There is a partial hardening. So God has not changed his mind, but there is a delay in the will of God for the nation of Israel. Why has there been a delay? Why has there been a postponement of the messianic kingdom? Because Israel rejected Jesus at his first coming. The reason for the delay lies at the feet of the nation of Israel, and particularly the religious leaders. Because they rejected Jesus, blasphemed Jesus, resisted Jesus, ignored Jesus, refused Jesus, because they eventually crucified Jesus through the means of the Gentiles, God said, okay, if that's what you're going to do with my son at his first coming, at the offer of your kingdom, then I'm going to postpone this glorious kingdom from you. The rejection of Jesus Christ by the nation of Israel culminating in the cross is the most significant event in world history. Simply put, Jesus, uh, Israel's rejection of Jesus demarcates human history. It is the dividing line for the history of the world. Or to say it another way, when Israel rejected Jesus at his first coming, the entire world, like it or not, believe it or not, want it or not, the entire world moved into the postponement age. And that's where we find ourselves today. We're still in that same era. And if we are to successfully understand the postponement age, if we're to navigate the postponement age, if we're to have the right expectations for the way things ought to be in the world right now and in the church, then we must understand the conditions to expect. And that's what we're seeing in the parables of Matthew 13. We're learning about the conditions of the postponement age. We're learning about the conditions between first advent and second advent. And per primarily that covers the church age, the age that we're in. So far we've seen two of these conditions. The first we saw was from the parable of the sower, and it was this, that sowing gospel seed yields various results. Sowing gospel seed yields various results. That was condition number one. That's what we should expect in this age. Condition number two we've seen several weeks ago from the parable of the wheat and the tares that good and evil coexist until the second coming. Good and evil will coexist. Good and evil must coexist until the second coming. We will never eradicate the world of evil or sin. We will never have perfectly pure churches or families or government. It will never be as it ought to be because tares will grow alongside wheat until the second coming. It must be this way. This is a condition we must expect. That was the second. Today we'll see a third condition. A third condition of the postponement age and it's this, God's work starts small and yet may grow to great and huge influence. We're going to see this from the next two parables that we're going to consider. And we read the first one now in verse 31 and 32 of Matthew 13. This is the parable of the mustard seed. And the second one we'll look at this morning is the parable of the leaven. These parables are very, very similar, if not identical in meaning. And they both show us this third condition of God's work. God's work through the gospel starts small and yet grows to great influence. So look at verse 31, Matthew 13. He presented another parable to them saying, <clears throat> The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds 
But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. So Jesus takes us back to seeds again and back to farming in the field. And we've got a man who is a gardener now, a farmer, and he speaks of this mustard seed. Now, it's not the smallest seed in, on human record, but it was the smallest seed that they knew of in their world. A mustard seed is about the size of a BB. I mean, we're talking a tiny little seed. And Jesus says here, you take this tiny seed, the man sows it in his field. It's the smallest of all all their known seeds and then in one growing season he, he calls it a tree which is hyperbole. It doesn't grow into a literal tree. It grows into a, a 15 foot high shrub. A mustard shrub that he refers to here as a tree by way of exaggeration. And this happens from this BB to this 15 foot tree in one growing season. That's the amazing part of this. So from tiny to towering, from impossibly small so that you could barely see it if it said in the palm of your hand, to something of staggering and even rapid influence. So much so that this little tiny seed within one year's time becomes a, a bush that birds of the sky come and nest in. They find protection in this shrub. They find comfort. They find shade. This becomes a home to them, starting off with this tiny seed. Now these birds of the sky Jesus refers to here is an allusion to Gentiles. Gentiles coming into the protection and the shade of God and particularly Christ. Turn your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 17 for a moment. So when he refers here in our parable to the birds of the air, and you'll notice that it's in all caps perhaps in your Bible in Matthew, and that's showing us that it's a reference or an allusion to places in the Old Testament. The birds of the air come and nest in its branches. One of the allusions is Ezekiel 17. And I want to just show you this one. One of the uh, most neglected books of the Bible for sure, the book of Ezekiel. But look at chapter 17 and verse 22, and you'll see uh, this allusion. Beginning in verse 22, thus says the Lord God, I will also take a sprig from the lofty top of the cedar and set it out. I will pluck from the topmost of its young twigs a tender one, and I will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the high mountain of Israel I will plant it, and uh, that I may bring forth bogs and bear fruit and become a stately cedar." And birds of every kind will nest under it. They will nest in the shade of its branches. All the trees of the field will know that I am the Lord. I bring down the high tree and I exalt the low tree. I dry up the green tree and I make the dry tree to flourish. I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will perform it. So there's one of the illusions, and the other one, is, we won't go look at it, but it's in, it's in Daniel, in Daniel chapter 4, in that chapter that talks about Nebuchadnezzar, and describes Nebuchadnezzar, who's the king of Babylon, who is the king of the greatest nation in the world at that time, the world power, right? And this great king, he's in fact called the king of kings, Nebuchadnezzar is, in Daniel. And it has this statement in Daniel 4.12, it speaks of Nebuchadnezzar is like a tree, with this great amount of protection and provision for people of the world. He is the greatest of all Gentile kings. And, and it says there in Daniel 4.12 that the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches. And here is a clear reference again to Gentile birds, if you will. Birds of the sky coming in and sheltering and nesting under the great leadership of this uh, Gentile king. Now, whether we're talking about Ezekiel or the Daniel passage, neither passage describes the postponement age per se. I'm not saying that that's what those passages are saying. I'm saying that they're describing Gentiles as nesting like birds. And that's what this parable is doing. It's what it's alluding to. 
You've got Gentiles who are finding a rest in a certain place, and this certain place is a luxurious tree that grew exponentially from a tiny, tiny seed. Now you need to understand that often in the Bible, birds are used uh, symbolically of evil, but not always. Birds are not always spoken of as evil. Here they are then, saved Gentiles, picture this, who are nesting and resting in Jesus. Who's already said in this gospel, come to me and I will give you rest. So Jesus is the mustard seed that grows into the flourishing tree that provides a place of protection and comfort and shade from the wrath of God even. These saved Gentiles finding protection in Christ, protection in the gospel, protection even by extension in the shade and the comfort of God's church. Where would your life be without God's church? I don't know how we can separate Christ from the gospel from the church because we are His body, right? We are His hands and feet. He is the head. We are the body. And so we, we have here in the picture of the church a place where the saved Gentile, right, can come and find a, a nest, can come and find a home, can come and find rest for your souls and the people of God to walk alongside you. Can you imagine the emptiness and the bleakness of your life without the local church? Praise the Lord for this gift He's given us. Once again, Matthew is now touching upon the Gentile mission. So often people will look at the gospel of Matthew and say that's a Jewish gospel to Jewish people and has nothing to do with Gentiles and nothing could be further from the truth. He started talking about Gentiles in chapter 1. In the genealogy, he started talking about Rahab the harlot there in Jericho. He started talking about Ruth in the genealogy of Christ. Matthew will continually weave into this gospel the Gentile mission of Jesus Christ in the church and here it is once again we are the birds of the air who have come to nest in its branches what a wonderful picture so the big point of this parable is that we can expect God's work in the postponement age to start tiny mustard seed almost invisible imperceptible and yet grow to an immense influence and it can do so even rapidly and it can do so according to God's sovereign design. God determines the pace and the scope and the size of all of those things. Look over in Matthew 13, verse 10 for a moment. We've got to go back to this key phrase of verse 10 and 11 and answer uh, the, the question that's posing here. So he says in verse 10, the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them and said to you, you disciples, you elect ones, you graced ones, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been granted. And so we've seen this, right? That the, the parables reveal and the parables conceal. But he uses this long phrase here, the only time in this chapter, the mysteries, plural, of the kingdom of heaven. And so we ask the question then, as we're looking at our particular mustard seed parable, the question becomes, what mystery of the kingdom of heaven does this parable reveal? Okay? That's the question. And here's the answer. God's work in the postponement age, this, is, this might be the most important thing I'll say today, God's work in the postponement age will not be cataclysmic and overwhelming in power like it will be when Jesus comes at the second coming. When he comes at the second coming, he will come in power and great glory. He will come as a force to be reckoned with. He will come as a roaring lion exterminating his enemies and saving Israel. But that's not how God's work works in the postponement age. It does not work from a position of great power or great strength. We work, in fact, from the opposite position. We work from the position of weakness, of meekness, of mildness, of humility, of tenderness. We work like a mustard seed, a tiny mustard seed planted in the field. 
And this is the mystery that Jesus is revealing. They were expecting a, a Messiah King to come conquering on his white horse. And yes, that will happen, but not now in the postponement age. Instead of an overwhelming, dominating kind of power, instead we're going to have the work of God starting small and being imperceptible like a mustard seed, and yet, by God's grace, it can grow to massive, massive influence. Now, let me give you some biblical principle uh, illustrations of this principle. They're really all through the Bible, uh, this, this, this concept of the mustard seed parable. The first one I share with you is this. God came to a single man, a single little tiny mustard seed. His name was Abram. God came to Abram and he made him an outlandish promise. He said, I'm going to make you, Abram, a great nation. All right, that's wonderful. What, what do you have to have to have a great nation? You've got to have two things. You've got to have people and you've got to have land. And God comes to Abram and says, I'm going to make you a great nation. Well, Abram's got two problems. He doesn't have land and he doesn't have people. <laughs> he has no heir. He has no son. He and his, with his wife Sarah, she's barren. And so God is making this promise to this Abram. And here we have this tiny mustard seed who God says, Abram, I'm going to change your name to Abraham. I'm going to make you the father of a multitude. And you're going to own the most important real estate on the planet. Talk about mustard seed to a 15-foot tree. Talk about a man who becomes in his lineage a giant tree whom Jews and Gentiles have gone to, in a sense, and nested in his branches. See, if you're in Christ this morning, you're a child of who? Abraham. You are a spiritual child of Abraham if you're in Christ this morning. If you're Jewish, you're ethically a child of Abraham as well. And so what an example of a mustard seed that, that grew exponentially uh, through the, this tiny seed of one man. And what did God say to him in part of this covenant, part of this promise? He said, Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless every family on the earth. I'm going to bless everyone in the world, Jews and Gentiles, because it would be through Abraham that Christ would come. And so there's an example of this parable. Here's another one. After Christ's crucifixion, resurrection, and after his ascension, you could have gone to this upper room there in Jerusalem, and you would have found 120 people. 120 people after three years of Christ's ministry huddled there, frightened in that upper room, gathered in prayer, waiting for the promise that he had said he would bestow on them. And within days, people, within days, 120 Jewish disciples become over 5,000. So here in the upper room is a mustard seed. And within days, a, a quick season of growth, 3,000 are saved, and then 2,000 more are saved, and these are all primarily Jewish converts. Here's a third illustration. It's like the day that Peter walked into the house of Cornelius. We don't talk about this day enough as Gentile Christians. Peter, the apostle, walks into the house of Cornelius, and Cornelius has gathered uh, his family and servants and friends there in his home. And so you know it's a small crowd. It can't be hundreds of people. It's probably 10 or 20 people. And right there in that moment, Peter preaches the gospel, and we have the Gentile Pentecost. The Holy Spirit falls on that group now, how many Gentile believers since the day Peter walked into the house of Cornelius has nested in the church since that day? How mighty this tree has grown over the decades and the centuries. And so we have here in this parable then uh, uh, an indication of the condition of the postponement age. God's work starts small and tiny and imperceptible. But by his grace and by his power, it becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Now, Jesus will leave behind the farmer. He's going to leave behind the seed. And he's going to turn his attention to observe a woman in her kitchen making bread. Yes, he's going from farm to table. <laughs> All right, verse 33, he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. 
which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leavened. Now, just as birds of the air don't always represent evil, neither does yeast or leaven always represent evil in the Bible. Often it does. Often leaven is a symbol for sin and it spreads like gangrene, right? That's true, but that's not always true and it's not true here. Leaven here is used in a positive sense. We need to remember that the Jews used leaven 51 out of 52 weeks. <laughs> we seem to get all caught up on just the one week that they couldn't use leaven. It was one week out of the year. And so what Jesus now is alluding to here, the kingdom of heaven is like this leaven, this yeast. A woman takes it and she hides it in three pecks of flour until all of the flour, all of the dough is leavened. What he is describing here is exactly what's going on in our day and age in the sourdough bread craze. Right? So you got your starter thing. What do you call that? The, the starter. That's what you call it. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> T T Toby's always real helpful. Things like that. So you got your starter. You're not taking powdered yeast and working it into the powder of the flour with this sourdough bread craze. You take some dough that has already had yeast in it. You take some of that out of your starter and you work that into your next loaf, right? And you always keep that starter going. That fermented dough is always present and you can borrow from it. That's what's happening here. It's the exact same thing that's going on. She's going to take some fermented dough, this woman in her kitchen, and she's going to knead it and work it into a new batch for a new loaf. Now, often a parable will have a twist in the story. It'll have a shocker, and this one does too. And it's not obvious from our translation, but the shock of this story is she's working this yeast into 50 pounds of flour. <laughs> and so as Jesus would have shared this, the women in the crowd would have probably kind of chuckled under their breath. <laughs> They're like, he doesn't, he, you know, they would, have, they've got, they would have got a laugh out of that. He is talking about the outer limits now of what a little Jewish woman could actually handle. This would be enough bread for 150 people. We're talking about bread for a banquet here, not for the family dinner. And so Jesus throws this little twist into it to show how such a small amount of leaven can work into three pecks of flour, 50 pounds of, of dough until all of it is leavened. The point again here is similar if not identical. God's work in the postponement age is like this leaven. It starts small, it starts invisible, it starts imperceptible. But here's the key, leaven is irresistible. It can't be stopped. I mean, once you've put it into that dough, you can't take it out again. It's going to do its work. It's going to have its influence. And that leaven is going to spread here in the, in the parable of 50 pounds. It's going to spread far and it's going to spread wide. So again, it's really the same point. Now let's step back and see big picture here. We've looked now at four uh, parables, four of the seven in this chapter. In the parable of the sower, which was the first one, Jesus was the ultimate sower. Right? We as his disciples sow his seed, but when he told the parable of the sower, the sower, sower, the capital S sower is Jesus, sowing his gospel. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, Jesus is the sower of the wheat. I mean, we don't have to guess. He tells us, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So what about now? What about in the parable of the mustard seed and the leaven? I think that the, the same holds true. I, I think Jesus is the ultimate mustard seed. Jesus is the ultimate mustard seed that becomes the ultimate tree of shade and protection of rest and of nesting. And Jesus is also the leaven here, leaven used in a positive way. Jesus and the power of the gospel spreading, spreading irresistibly throughout the world. You see, the, the power of the gospel through the Holy Spirit is an unstoppable force, just like leaven is in a batch of dough. Or we could say it this way, Jesus is the gospel. Jesus is the good news for sinners. The person and the work of Christ is the good news for sinners and sufferers in this world. 
He is the mustard seed. He is the leaven. He is the sower of the wheat. He is the ultimate sower of the gospel. Think about it. And we can certainly tie into the Christmas season right here. Jesus came into this world small and humble and tiny and imperceptible and gentle and unnoticed. He came into this world so tiny and so unnoticed he was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He was the seed of the woman. He was born in a humble manger to poor peasants who could not afford anything but the turtle dove offerings at his circumcision. He grew up like a little tiny obscure mustard seed in obscure and despised Nazareth. He didn't settle in Judea. He didn't settle in Jerusalem. He didn't live the life of a king in a palace. He lived under peasants, poor, dirt poor, scratching out an existence in a faraway little town that was despised because of the Gentile presence there. He was a mustard seed. He came tiny and weak and imperceptible and he was sown in the field of the world only to grow into this massive tree that will welcome any who will come to him and find rest there. He's also the leaven. You think about this. He submitted to his cousin for baptism and after doing so, he didn't stomp around and scream and shout and demand. and He didn't break off a bruised reed. He didn't lift up his voice in the streets. He came into the world like leaven. He, in, he influenced people gently and subtly and, and sometimes imperceptibly. He used words and deeds of love to be a leaven-like influence. And so it is for us today. So it is for the church in the church age. So it is for the disciples of the followers of Christ on the Calvary Road, those carrying a cross in the postponement age. We do not advance like a 10-ton bulldozer. Okay, the church is not here to claim power and wealth and political might that is antithetical to the postponement age and to the gospel. We don't bowl people over. We don't try to tear down and destroy our enemies. The church is not here to push over obstacles like a tree in the way of a bulldozer. We're not here to uproot enemies of the gospel like they're our own personal enemies. No, we're in the postponement age where things work like leaven and, and like a mustard seed growing into a tree. And you say, well, what about revivals? Yes, there are revivals, but revivals are not the norm. Revivals are special. Revivals are rare. I mean, America's probably had one legitimate revival in our history. God can bring revival, but that's not the normal way God works. See, revival is like a bulldozer, right? <laughs> Plowing a path of, of, of conversions. But, but what's normal is leaven. I didn't even, I didn't even notice. I didn't, couldn't even tell. And before you know it, 50 pounds of dough has been leavened. So the church then, and you think about it. You think about our history as a church. We're like a scoop of leaven with a worldwide influence, Right? The church is all over the world today. And we've had influence now for 2,000 years. <laughs> 2,000 years of leaven-like influence. So the third condition of the postponement age is the work of God starts small and expands in exponentially and inevitably all according to His sovereign design. Let me give you three lessons then by way of application. Number one, when you're starting or joining a ministry... Don't despise small beginnings. This is one of Mary Dale Craig's favorite sayings, by the way, if you knew Mary Dale. She would say this all the time. Don't despise small beginnings. That's what these parables teach us. I think about Charles Spurgeon as a 16-year-old. He had just been saved. In his first sermon, he was tricked. An older man tricked him. They were going to a Bible study in a house out in some remote village, and they had to walk a few hours to get there. And, and as they're walking, the, the older man basically lets him in on the secret that Spurgeon is going to preach his first sermon. And he didn't know it until they started off on this, on this journey, but he knew he would have enough time to get his thoughts together. Spurgeon's first sermon was to a little house full of about eight people, most of them elderly and hard of hearing. <laughs> and within two years, he was preaching to 6,000 people. Don't despise small beginnings. I think of Diedrich Bonhoeffer in Germany. 
This man was gifted beyond measure. He spoke multiple languages, was gifted musically. His intellect was off the charts. He came from a privileged background. His, his father was the chief psychiatrist for the entire nation of Germany. This man was brought up with the finest of learning and culture. God called him to ministry, and he was willing to leave all of that behind. And as part of his training, after he had studied theology, he went to Barcelona, Spain. And he went there to be an assistant pastor. This is Diedrich Bonhoeffer, y'all. I mean, we're reading biographies about him today. He goes to Barcelona, Spain to be an assistant pastor responsible for the children's ministry. It's so precious. And he gets there and he begins to conduct children's services. And the first Sunday of his first children's service, one girl came. And he wrote in his diary, he said this, that will have to improve. <laughs> <laughs> Week number two, he had 15 kids. That week he visited every one of those children in their home. Week three, he had 30 kids. And he had that the entire year he was there. All started with this one girl. That must have been one special little girl too. So <laughs> she got the word out. Don't despise small beginnings when you start a ministry or join a ministry. I think of our dear friends and brothers, uh, Michael Beck and Joey Bellington, who were with us several years ago, and they left here as two families. And now at Grace Bible Church in Bernie, they are 40 families. And there are 70 members and, and probably 70 kids <laughs> with those 70 members. Because Michael and Joey have like 15 by themselves. So... <laughs> So, so is that exponential growth? Yes. Is there still room for all kinds of growth? Yes, of course. I mean, how, what, what can happen with 40 families and 70 members? I think of our very own church, of course. And our beginnings, very humble, very small, with a handful of families saying, we want more, we want something different, we want the Word of God. And now here we are, 185 families and 320-something members and welcome 21 this morning. I mean, we welcome more members this morning than this church started with, far more. This is how God's work happens. It's, it's just like that. Don't despise small beginnings in the postponement age. Number two, and these are related, so we go from that to this. Keep tending the garden and kneading the dough. All right, let's use these pictures now. Just, just keep at it. Just keep working the garden and keep working the dough. Now you think about those two activities. Gardening and bread making are not super exciting. They're not glamorous. You do it a few times. It's not romantic. It's, it's work, all right? It's just work. And the results are often slow in coming and they're hard to see. The key is to stick with it. I think these two parables would show us just to stick with it, just to keep going. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. In due time. Who, who gets to decide the time? God does. And so keep gardening, all right? You don't despise the small beginnings, and then once you're in the ministry, once you've started, just keep gardening. Just keep, keep watering, keep planting seeds, keep pulling weeds, keep tending to the plant. Just keep gardening. Results will come in God's timing. Keep kneading the dough. Just keep working it. The leaven will spread. See, we need to focus on obedience to God, not the results. We have no say-so over the results. We don't get to decide if the tree becomes 10 feet tall or 12 feet tall or 15 feet tall or how many branches it has or how many birds come and find a nest in it. No, we get to focus on our obedience to God or to use a sports analogy, focus on the process and not the scoreboard. The scoreboard is irrelevant. The scoreboard will take care of itself. Focus on the process, on the next play, on the next practice, on the next day, on the next ministry activity. The great uh, free safety, Troy Palamalu, you may recognize him from some uh, shampoo commercials. He's got quite the head of hair. Troy Palamalu played for the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, back uh, several years ago, a few years ago, when they'd won one of their uh, Super Bowls. And in one interview, this is so interesting, it always stood out with me. They asked him, what is the secret to the Steelers' success? And Troy Palamalu, he's a very religious person. I don't know if he's a born-again Christian, but he's a very, very religious, spiritual man. And, they, and this interviewer says, what's the secret? 
secret to your success. And he said something I've never heard any athlete ever say before or since. He said the secret to our success is that we are an obedient group. We are, I mean, these are multimillionaires, right? The greatest athlete, he said, we are an obedient group, meaning we do what our coach says to do. <laughs> that's the secret to our success. And I think that's an illustration. That's, that's what we need to be about. That's what we need to be able to say. Finally, number three of these three lessons, um, don't despise small beginnings. Keep tending the garden. Number three, keep it simple. Keep it simple. You know, gardening and bread making are pretty simple. They're pretty basic. They've been going on. <laughs> they've been going on for thousands of years. Now you can make them complex. You can turn gardening and bread making into molecular biology and organic chemistry. I mean, you can get it all super complex and and you know fall into this paralysis by analysis thing. You know, or you can just grow a garden and make some bread. Well, what's my point in all of that? Don't let evangelism and ministry become paralysis by analysis. Don't fall into the cultural trap of abundance of caution. Can't evangelize here, can't do this ministry, can't try that out of an abundance of caution. Now what are we doing when we say that? We're saying that we think we can predict the outcome which is nothing but pride. Don't imagine that you can predict any outcomes. You can't. Keep it simple. Stay focused on obedience, on the task at hand. If we were to say keep it simple, what's the, what's the basic truth? The basic truth is everyone needs the Lord. <laughs> everyone is a lost sinner, and Jesus Christ is the only solution. So every single person you and I know, every single child in our home, every, every person that we know, if they don't, they're not born again. They need the Lord. Keep it simple. <laughs> Don't overanalyze it. Don't overthink it. It's not that complex. There's one great problem. There's one great solution. We have the solution. So let's be about tending the garden and kneading the dough. Well, that kind of concludes the sermon, kind of, but this is a sermon with a P.S. Because the text has a P.S. And I'm a slave to the text. So look at verse 34 and 35, and this is what we'll close with. This is a parenthetical, verses 34 and 35 is a parenthetical statement Matthew puts into the text for his readers. <clears throat> I'm calling it the P.S. on the sermon. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. So bear with me for a few more minutes. I have one page of notes on this and we'll be done. So you look at verse 35 and there's two lines there and they're in all caps. That means it comes from the Old Testament. The first line is from the Septuagint word for word. The second line is Matthew's own translation from the Masoretic text. This comes from Psalm 78 verse 2, a psalm of Asap. And Asap is called a seer in the Old Testament, and here he's called a prophet in the New Testament. And so that's where this is coming from. It's very obscure. It's very surprising that Jesus or Matthew would quote this as a fulfillment of prophecy. The basic point of this verse 35 is this. When, now listen, when Jesus spoke in parables, he was intentionally fulfilling prophecy. Let that sink in. When Jesus used a method of teaching called parables, comparisons, analogies, he was deliberately and intentionally linking himself to the Old Testament and fulfilling a prophecy for himself. Folks, that is a level of precision and detail that is beyond our comprehension. We think prophecy born in Bethlehem, prophecy the cross, we think prophecy second, we think all these big, big things, right? We're talking a teaching method here. We're talking a style of giving truth to people and Jesus says, I've got to do that to fulfill Old Testament prophecy about myself. That's the basic point Matthew is making in verses 34 and 35. But I want to go a little deeper because it is, it is a deeper issue because of Psalm 78. 
Psalm 78 is a really long psalm. We're not going to go look at it. Take you 10 minutes to read it. It recounts God's faithful love to Israel despite Israel's unbelief and unfaithfulness to God. That's the theme of Psalm 78. God is faithful to you rejecting Israel even though you are unfaithful to God. And I'm going to recount this faithfulness of God so that, this is Psalm 78, so that future generations of Israelites will know the ways of the Lord. So when Jesus used parables to conceal truth from unbelievers and to reveal truth to disciples, he was showing his faithfulness as God in the flesh to Israel despite Israel's unfaithfulness to him. Matthew wants us to see this. Matthew wants us to link the ministry of Jesus in parables to Psalm 78 to say to that generation of Israelites, you too are just like your fathers. You have rejected Christ. You have blasphemed God, but He is faithful to you. Psalm 78. So we could say it this way. The parables of Matthew 13 are Psalm 78 all over again. And Asaph has become Jesus. Jesus then in these parables, are, are, he's revealing mysteries of the kingdom of God so that future generations of disciples, that's us, will do exactly what Psalm 78 says, which are these three things, that we would rely on God, that we would not forget his works, but that we would keep his commands. That's Psalm 78, verse 7. And so what an incredible linkage these two verses are that Matthew has inserted here into the text as Jesus fulfills prophecy. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ in every single moment was fulfilling prophecy of one kind or another, did so faithfully, fully, and so, Lord, we can trust that those prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled will be done so literally and, and perfectly and completely. Father, we also pray today that we could be this leaven and be this uh, mustard seed, little mustard seeds like the great mustard seed and, and leaven like the great leaven of Christ. So Lord, that we would spread our influence and your influence of the gospel. We would do so consistently and faithfully. We thank you today that even though we have been unfaithful, you have been faithful to us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.